Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Jamie Hopkins, and joined by Anna that's here today. And we're excited to be talking a little bit about college education planning, hopefully, with Anna Garcia, who's an author and partner in a firm. And so, Anna, excited to have you on here and joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, you know, we, we typically have a, a couple icebreakers at the beginning. And I know before we started recording, they said uh, we're going to have to figure uh, figure out what's closed food wise <laughs> in your area and figure out how to get the Chipotle out there. But uh, that's a uh, before we dive into food, though, I just want to put that out there first. Uh, uh, t- give us the 30 seconds of who you are, what you do, just for those of us who you know haven't met you before out there, listeners uh, that don't know you. Yeah, so I, um, I'm i a fee-only fiduciary advisor at Independent Progressive Advisors in Portland, Oregon. Um, and for a long time, I've been writing a blog called The College Financial Lady. And um, two going on two years ago now, an opportunity came up for me to convert that into a book. And so my book, How to Pay for College, is coming out this, this summer from Harriman House. That's exciting. Harriman House is a they're a good publisher too. We've worked with them before and you know, so hopefully that process has gone well for you so far. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they've been they've yeah. been great. I mean, I have no no point of reference, but others have told me that <laughs> that I'm fortunate to be there. <laughs> Yeah, I've self-published before, and you know I'm a, I'm a terrible uh, self-publisher, so you should not work with me. I, I know that that was a bad process, so they, they've been much better in the history of working with them. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, we like to talk about food a little bit, uh, and we'll get back to the book later. Uh, do you have a favorite thing that comes to mind when you think about food? Favorite item of food, what it means to you, what first comes to your mind? You know, it's funny. We were just talking about food the other day with some with some friends, and we were talking about like the first time we went back to an actual restaurant post COVID, and how delicious French fries were when they were fresh <laughs> fresh out of the fryer. Um, um, so that was you know that was a favorite for about fifteen minutes at a time. But I'm I'm pretty much of a foodie. I eat I eat all of it, and we have such a great restaurant scene here here in Portland. Do you have a favorite French fry? Like if you, if you like a, a place that you would go, if like you only get have French fries one more time, where would you go? Oh, I, you know, I have to confess McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, but you know, a good truffle fry would, uh, would probably be better than that. But if I had limited time left, I just wouldn't want to be driving around trying to find a truffle fry when there's a McDonald's <laughs> on every corner. <laughs> Yeah, you were saying earlier that the before we hopped on the call that Portland has such a good food scene that you don't you kind of disappointed when you go to other cities that it's not the same, not as good as Portland. Is that do, so? Is there a favorite restaurant in Portland that you like? Like that's your go to that you love a lot. Um, you know, we have so many good, so many good little places. There's a tiny sushi place that we go to um, called Toshi's that's just got amazing, amazing fresh, um, fresh fish. Um, there's, uh, um, you know, Portland has a lot of little neighborhoods and then a lot of food cart pods, too, which are a big part of the dining scene. So there's this one really fun area. There's a restaurant called Prost that's a brew pub, and then it's got all different food carts. Um, so you you know you get your beer, and everyone gets the food they want, which is makes for a good family outing because no one's arguing about where you're going to go. Everyone gets to get what they um, get what they want. So Anne, tell us about your first money memory. Oh my gosh! Um, so I was thinking about this the other day. So um, so when when I was younger, my brother and I one day decided that we were going to have a garage sale. And, you know, budding entrepreneurs that we were, we put a lot of thought into what we were going to sell and picking up our garage and whatnot. We didn't spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that we were the last house on a dead end street. Um, And not only that, but that street was on top of a hill. So Mm -hmm. we could expect exactly you know, both of our neighbors to come to the garage sale. <laughs> so by the end of the day, you know, we'd probably made two dollars because each neighbor had come over and bought something. And um, and so my grandma came out to the garage and she's like, oh, my gosh, you have all this stuff left over. We're like, yeah, because it didn't really sell. And she said, well, I'll give you twenty dollars for all of it. And so we're like, have it. <laughs> this is great. If we just 10 X our profits. <laughs> and sure. and she and she got this really horrified look on her face. She's like, you shouldn't just take that offer. You should 
you know, you should negotiate for more. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, we did it wrong. And and even as a kid, like I could different, I, I could recognize that the same thing had felt really good and then felt really bad. Um, and, and, and I guess I've sort of always carried that with me that so much of how we think about money is, is perception versus, you know, versus the reality and versus the real, reality of it. That's a neat lesson that your grandma taught you there. Like, did you take that into the rest of your life? Like, do you always think like, oh, I should ask for a better price or even like going into your <laughs> career, like I should negotiate my salary. Like, that's not a lesson lots of kids learn. So that's, I'm curious to know, did that kind of spill over? <laughs> um, a little bit, but you know, it's kind of funny because I, the way she said it, we, my brother and I both felt so bad about it. Like we had done something really wrong by not, she by not shamed doing you. That. Yeah, she really did. <laughs> So, so I've had sort of a, a, you know, a mixed relationship with that topic, I would say over, over my life, but. Well, I have. But yeah, my mother-in-law, she's, she's, she's the complete opposite. She's, you know, like she'll plan a family vacation. She's like, okay, we've decided where we're going to go. Now it's time to start the negotiations. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So did you actually have a garage too? It's a very interesting thing. I, I don't know if it's like regional but like the difference from yard sale and garage sale, and I don't know why people use different terms, but I have noticed like around me, most people say they're having yard sales versus garage sales. And I mean, it's literally like coming out of their garage, but it's a, I have no idea. (laughs) No, it was a garage sale in an actual garage. Yeah. On the top of a hill and the driveway went like down the hill into the garage. So, you know, from a marketing perspective, it was not not a good, Good approach from a life lesson set up. It was rich. <laughs> we used to have them when, when I was little. And I remember my brother always used to tease, like, we're having a garbage sale. <laughs> like, it's nothing but garbage. <laughs> <or selling. laughs> so I never thought fondly of them after that. <laughs> did What did you guys do with your, your uh, grand total there? Did you spend it? Did you buy something? Do you oh, remember? I'm sure. I, I, you know, I don't remember, so I'm going to say it all went to candy. Yeah. Because that's the age that we were. And that was important. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so we traded junk for something really important. Candy. Yeah. Uh, Anna, do you like negotiating stuff with people? No, I don't. Not, right? I yeah. don't. I And we we actually, we just went to Mexico City and we were in Coyoacan, which is like the, it's like this really darling little section of Mexico City where Frida Kahlo lived and they have all the artisans with their mark. And I was actually like, I found some really beautiful earrings and they were only $8. And I was like, are you serious? No, you need to charge more for these, sir. Like, <laughs> this is art that you're making. <laughs> So I'm the worst. I'm negotiating. I'm paying more for the earrings. And they're unnegotiating. <laughs> like, no, you don't understand. So you're an artist. In the United States, this would be $95. <laughs> so yeah, no, Jamie, I don't. <laughs> I'm bad at it. Yeah, I don't particularly like it either. But I definitely, uh, yeah, I, I definitely have gotten better over time at it. But like, I don't know, I kind of grew up probably feeling a similar thing. Like I felt some level of shame having to like negotiate pricing around stuff, right? Like that's, I, and I don't know what memory it came from, but that's how I feel when I have to negotiate price. And it's, you know, there's joking sayings around that, which are probably true, right? Like if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it type of jokes, right? But it's like a real thing, right? You feel some shame related to having to like not be able to just walk in and pay for it and not worry about it. Well, and I think so often, you know, so often things that you're expected to negotiate for, like cars and stuff, you just feel bad after, you know, and not, not that I didn't get something, but I, if I was better at this, I probably would have, would have got more, which is why I think so many people are just like, I'll pay a big dealer markup if it means I don't have to negotiate and I don't have to wonder if I could have got it for, for, Mm -hmm. for less. But I remember early in my career one time, um, talking with a friend who was hiring for, a position at um, at her firm, and she said she'd found this candidate who she really liked, and made an offer to him, and he just accepted the offer without negotiating. and And she's like, it kind of makes me think twice about him because it was for a marketing role. And she said, I I just don't think as a marketing person you should not negotiate your offer because part of your job is going to be negotiating stuff. 
Yeah, there's a whole host of stuff to unpack there. Like, I just, I mean, I know Jamie's heard me on my soapbox about this, but I, I didn't know that you had to negotiate. Like, at the beginning of my career, I didn't know that was a thing. And there's like, I think that's a whole thing with a lot of people in different communities. Like, they just don't know. I, like me, I, you just don't know that that's a thing that you have to do. So, anyways, I get off my soapbox there. <laughs> No, I, that whole, the whole like negotiate afterwards thing is such a strange thing, right? Like, I think I would just be happy at this point if I made somebody an offer and there was zero negotiation. <laughs> I think we have 42 open roles right now. So that means 42 times where we're going to renegotiate. Right, if they would just say yes. <laughs> yeah. Just and, and know, <laughs> we made you the best offer that we're going to make you. And <laughs> Yeah, I don't like negotiating, so... I don't know. Makes sense. But yeah, my sister just accepted a new job and she called me and she said a similar thing. She's like, I actually like like the job offer as it is. But aren't you like supposed to negotiate? And I gave her like three things to ask for and they gave her all three. So, you know, flip side is that mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, there probably is something if they think you're the right candidate. So if you're hearing this right, make sure you ask for something. And then also, like, I always had a bit, I have a bit of advice for people on that, too. Not that this is Jamie advice time, but, you know, if if you're on like I've, I've heard a couple people say this, like, oh, well, I don't want to ask and I don't know if I'm going to take the job. And uh, I told somebody recently, I was like, but if you're not going to take the job, ask for what you would want to take the job. Right. Like because worst case scenario here is you're already not taking the job. So if they say no, you're still not taking the job. Right. So yeah, but it's a great opportunity to practice Yeah, when it's, true. when it's something you don't care about. Yeah. Or maybe you get surprised and they go all the way to where you wanted them to go. Right. And then all of a sudden you would take the job. So that's uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm imagining like most people in our profession, you did not wake up one day and say, I want to be a financial advisor when the marketing garage sale failed. Right. You were like, well, <laughs> instead of doing this, I'm going to become an advisor and tell people how to spend this It won't this matter money. which house I live in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I live at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Busy <Easy> street. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, what, what did you think you wanted to be kind of, how did you end up into this uh, profession? Um, well, so I spent, I grew up in um, Silicon Valley. And so I spent the first part of my career working in, in technology, not out of any real thought about it. Um, but just because that, those were the jobs that were, that were there. And, um, and I spent a lot of that time at Intuit, which makes, you know, TurboTax and Quicken, now Mint.com and QuickBooks and whatnot. And we always joked at Intuit that every January 15th, all your friends call and ask for a free copy of TurboTax. And every April 15th, they call and ask what they should do with their tax refund. And, um, and I found I really enjoyed having those conversations um, with people and thinking about how to use money strategically and effectively and how to, you know, how to how to take small amounts and, and direct them towards towards bigger goals. And um, and so after I had my kids, I realized I didn't want to work in technology anymore. I didn't want the hours, the travel and all that. And um, and so I went and did the CFP curriculum and became an advisor. And so now I get to have that conversation with people all the time. So, and I know you have a, a couple of kids in college now. And so, so was, you know, planning for college, was that a niche that you kind of found on your own because you were interested in it or just because clients asked about things? How did you get into, you know, being more knowledgeable about that sector than, than most? Yeah, so I um so in part it was just as a parent it was a topic that I was the that I was interested in, but I also found that a lot of clients were asking questions about it and you know, if you go back in time, you know, to the ancient 10 years ago, um time, you know, if you asked advisors what clients should be doing for college, they would generally say people who can't figure out how to pay for college aren't clients of financial advisors. And I always thought that was kind of funny because people were asking a lot of questions um, about about it. And um, and and so I started, you know, I, I realized people were asking the same questions again and again and again. So I started just writing down the answers so that I could just send the same email again and again and again. And I realized very quickly that I had the beginnings of a blog and I started. So I started. Um, so I started writing that down. And then after a couple of years, I had a meeting one day with this um, with this woman who she was an attorney and she was really interested in making a career change. And I thought, you know, that's great. That sounds really great. Let's talk about it. 
Well, it turned out that she owed somewhere around $300,000 in um, all kinds of different student loans. So she had a whole bunch of federal loans that were in, um, you know, in an income-based payment thing plan. She had um, private loans that she had taken out, um, and then she had borrowed from family members um, in addition to all that. And so she was making minimum payments on her federal loans, which meant the balances were growing because she wasn't paying enough to cover the interest that accrued each month, um, making big payments on her private loans, and hadn't made a dent in the money that she owed to her family. And and so our conversation quickly went from planning for her career change to planning for her eventual insolvency, um, which is when your debts exceed your um, exceed your assets, and it's a way to have um, debt forgiven without it being taxable to to you. And that was the path that she was on because, um, you know, at the time she owed about three hundred thousand dollars, and when she got to the point of her loans being forgiven, she would still owe about three hundred thousand dollars and would have tax due on that three hundred thousand dollars if it were if it were forgiven and so i you know i that conversation that discussion really really stayed with me and you know made me think you know how how can we how can we minimize the number of people who find themselves in in that situation and how can um you know how can i as an advisor help families to make better decisions about this very big and very emotional decision because if you tell people you know if you tell a parent you can't afford to send your child to XYZ college they see they often see that as a personal failing of the parent that's going to have repercussions for the child over over their lifetime so it's you know it's the ultimate personal finance right it's so intensely personal to people what they want that experience for their child to be what those goals are you know what their goals are for their um, for their children but there's you know there's no avoiding the, the dollars around it. But, you know, the fortunate thing is we have this, uh, well, I should say the fortunate thing later. Um, we have this bizarro system where, you know, you could get a great college education at almost any price you're willing to pay if you're willing to take the time and figure and, and, and figure that out. So, you know, so so that's sort of the fortunate pieces. There are lots and lots of good opportunities for families to get great educations for their kids, um, you know, without knocking everything else completely, completely off the rails. Yeah, I think that that decision too is, um, it, like, it's it's a tough one because I I don't remember it as well as I I used to, right? But you kind of go back and try to put yourself in the mindset when I was going to college. And, you know, I, I know when I went to college, the financial decision was more important than I went to law school in my mind, right? Like going to college, it was like, what can we afford? Who's giving me the best scholarship? And that was a big driver. When I went to law school, I basically threw out the money, <laughs> like part of it. And I was basically like, well, area, and like the best ranked school in the area was kind of like in my mind. And that was like the only decision factor, right? And it was kind of like, well, literally everybody takes out all these loans, you'll be fine. And it was very much that attitude when you were looking at places. So I was, you know, not at 300,000, but I was at like 200,000 when I graduated law school. And at that point, I looked at uh, UPenn to go to business school there. And I could not stomach the fact that that was going to be like another 200,000. And I was like, I don't know how you get out of that then. Like I'm looking at like the interest that you pay on $400,000 of student loans, which is like, you know, some of those are like six and a half, seven percent then. And you're like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, like That's a mortgage. <laughs> yeah. And there's a mortgage with higher interest rates. And I can't sell back the degree at the end of it if I don't want to live there anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so, well, and yeah. you're talking about for law school, but mm -hmm. there are so many career paths, you know, physical therapists in many states now require a doctorate. Um, nurses all require a BSN. You know, there are loads and loads of career paths that require advanced or terminal degrees that don't have the, you know, that don't have the salaries that law school, medical, you know, medical school graduates um Earns, I, I, you know, there's this tendency to say, oh, you know, people who have tons of student loans have opportunities to make lots and lots of money to pay them off, and and that is sadly not not the case in so many in so many fields. 
And so in terms of college planning now, like, um, you know, when I went to school, I was looking at the cost of my undergraduate um, program. Now it's like $70,000 a year, which is roughly twice the cost it was when I went to school there and I had a scholarship. So that's why I chose the school that I chose. But what are some unique challenges to college planning that clients are kind of facing now that they didn't have to face 20 years ago that, you know, when they were maybe in school, now they're planning for their kids and they're, you know, have sticker shock. Yeah. So what are some, some methods or yeah. some, some advice you have for those clients? Well, I, you know, I think the most important thing is just to remember that your your kids have a different set of choices than you do. Um, you know, every generation has, you know, my generation had lots and lots of choices that our parents didn't have. Our kids have a different set, um, mm -hmm. set of, of choices. Um, I think one of the things that families really struggle with is that if you if you sit at the beginning of the process and you say, well, my kids could go to community college or they could go to Harvard and or not go to college at all. Um, so how do I plan for this range of outcomes that's between, you know, zero and three hundred thousand dollars per child? Um, and what you know, my my advice to families is you have to do what works for you. And um, because, you know, while it's true that the list price of college has gone up, you know, the average tuition inflation rate is about six or seven percent. Um, the net price that people actually pay has stayed pretty constant for the last decade. And so so don't look at what the sticker price is. Look at what's achievable, affordable and possible for your family and then find choices that 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 fit that knowing that a family's financial life isn't totally linear. You know, you go from expensive childcare to maybe public schools, maybe there's a, you know, family destination wedding somewhere along the way, or, you know, travel soccer team where you've got all kinds of, you know, bills, bills for that coming up. So family finances aren't, li aren't linear. You, you just need to but you do need to fit it in somewhere. You know, that whole, you know, save for retirement because there's loans available for college. That's how we got to, you know, a couple trillion dollars in outstanding student loan debt. Um, um, so, you know, families do need to do both and they need to figure out how to fit both in. Kind of my rule of thumb for people is if you're not saving for retirement, you're not saving for college. You know, do that. Get your emergency savings and your retirement savings going first. If you're not maxing out retirement, you shouldn't be giving more than 10%, contributing more than 10% to college of what you're contributing to retirement. So if you're doing $10,000 a year to retirement, don't do more than $1,000 a year to college. If you want to save more for college, figure out a way to save more for retirement first. And once you get to the point where you're maxing out retirement, then you have the flexibility to start looking at, you know, what are the range of choices I might want to make available for my child? And, um, and, and how does that savings, what does that savings budget look like to, to get me there over time? Um, but it's what's really unfortunate is that so many advisors will tell families, oh, well, if you want to send your kid to private school, you need to have $300,000 saved by the time they're 18. And I mean, my daughter goes to the most expensive college on earth, um, and it doesn't cost a whole lot more than paying in-state tuition would have cost because we did our homework and we identified that this was a school that was going to give her scholarships and she had a budget for college and fortunately for her this one fit in it you brought up a, a couple i, I like uh, some of these points around how do you balance this with all of the other right financial and life goals that somebody might have uh somebody i i'm gonna mess this up but somebody once said about this too to me like the you know uh, you don't get a scholarship for retirement too right like mm -hmm. uh, why you need to you know save for that right <laughs> and <laughs> i i like that one right like that's funny and uh but uh, but you know a... there's another thing you could retire when you're 65 you could retire when you're 68 you could retire when you're 70 you could retire when you're 55 but your kid's gonna go to college when they're 18. And that's not to say that retirement isn't important, but that is to say that that each 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 of those goals has a different set of levers that you can pull. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a 
that the brains that you know, I was like that's an interesting way to look at it and then my mind immediately went to I was like yeah but it's like 90% of the country retires in like a 3 year time frame which actually is a percentage is probably higher than the percent of people that go to college so actually you're probably more likely to retire between 62 and 65 than to go to college at 18 <laughs> Okay, yeah. yeah, doing the math. That could... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's, uh, but no, that's a, it's a good point, right? Like, I mean, if you're going to be on a traditional kind of path, uh, you're most likely to go to college pretty much when you graduate school, a uh, high school here in the United States, right? Like that's the path, and you don't deviate from it too much. But um, I think Broderick went to school at a different time, but I don't remember anymore. But he he doesn't get the hop on in the middle of the the episode, so that's yeah. fine. Well, I mean, I took a gap year after high school, yeah. and uh, and it's something I highly recommend to people. But it's 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 definitely not the not the typical path, um, other than kind of the pandemic years. A lot of you know a lot yeah. of kids did that. But did you work during that year or travel or what you do? Um, I was I I um I went to Germany as an exchange student. Awesome. And so then I took another gap year after college because some of my friends from my exchange year found me a job working over there. Oh. So what was your favorite part about being in Germany? Um, you know, it's 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 so much fun to live in another country because you have a whole different set of things that are just your everyday life. So um you know, your corner bar is a different place and your your commute is different and 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 you don't really care if the lawn gets mowed that weekend. And um, so I think just, you know, just that ex- the, the and I know I, that feels like nothing specific, but if you've done it, it is actually a very specific feeling, you know, just that sense of your everyday being being completely you know, being, being completely different. I, um, you know, I just met so many interesting people and made so, so many great friends. I was just on a, um, just did a zoom call a couple of weeks ago with some of my friends from my exchange here. Um, and it was, you know, it was right when the Ukraine war was starting and, um, and hearing, you know, how that was impacting them was, was, was really fascinating. One's a purchasing manager for a packaged food company. Um, and, uh, you know, was talking about the the race to buy sunflower oil that week, and um, you know, and they were already seeing their gas prices go through the roof. I mean, they were already, you know, in normal times, are four times they pay four times as much for gas as we do, but you know, it had gone even higher. And you know, so they were talking about bikes and public transit, and <laughs> um, you know, it seems like you made some lifelong friends there still interacting with them and still do you do you frequently go back and visit do you do you all have meetups or anything like that you know I feel like that's been one of the silver linings of the last couple of years is just yeah. the opportunity to to get get reacquainted with um with people you know when we were in college and pre-kids we all traveled back and forth um you know back and forth quite a bit I always early in my career I always looked for jobs that had a lot of travel um, as part of as part of them, so I could spend more time um, going back and forth. But you know, taking a taking a family of four over to Europe and you know hanging out with friends. You know, we we had big plans to go in the summer of 2020, and uh, <laughs> and everything got um, crazy. <laughs> yep, <laughs> destroyed your plans. <laughs> yeah. So so you know, hopefully next summer I'll get back there again. Yeah, I loved, I went to, I spent, I don't know, a little bit of time in Dusseldorf and I really liked it there because it was very different than any other place I had experienced. And um, I did drink a lot of beer there. This You mentioned beer before, but I think they call it alt beer in, in Dusseldorf, mm-hmm. which is just old beer, but um, it's all like tap and they have all these different places that make that traditional, it's like a very particular style that came from Dusseldorf and they really only make it there. And so it's uh, that was an interesting thing. And it was actually the first first time I had completely raw pork so in Dusseldorf they do like the they do just raw pork chopped up with onions on top of it Mm -hmm. and yeah it's a that's a weird texture (laughs) (laughs) yeah I ate it but I I did not it's not a big recommendation that I have back to others of uh that that experience you could probably take it or leave it when it comes to food (laughs) it's probably not something you're going to bring up on the favorite food section of the podcast anytime soon (laughs) 
No, it's uh, no. I don't think it's, I don't even think anyone there it's their favorite food. Like they eat it, and you're like, but does anyone actually like this? <laughs> you know, food is such a cultural thing, though. I mean, we as Americans expect lots and lots of choices and all of our preferences to be accommodated. Um, you know, and you go to other places and it just isn't like that. It's, yeah. you know, and, and nor is it expected. I mean, I remember years ago, a friend of mine was doing a work project in Lithuania and this woman he'd met on the project came over and visited and we went out for lunch together and I asked the, you know, the stupid question, how do you like it here? And, um, and she said, you know, it's really stressful here. And I said, what, do you, what does that mean? She said, you have to make so many choices about things that don't matter. And I said, what are you talking, you know, what, what do you mean things that don't matter? She's like, I mean, you go to a restaurant, like, why do you need 67 choices? And we were in a place that, you know, the menu was like a book. And she's like, like, what, a, who needs this? Why, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and so then the waiter came and said, you know, what would you like for lunch? And she just like slammed the menu shut. She just said, I just want a cheese sandwich. And he said, okay, what kind of cheese? And, <laughs> <laughs> and that blue, she's like, oh, I just, her head whatever. exploded. <laughs> Just I was like, she's like cheddar on wheat with mayonnaise. <laughs> you do get decision fatigue. That's a thing for, for sure. Yeah. Um, but Anna, I'm curious on your perspective about like this whole concept of choosing what you want to do with your life at 18 years old, right? And weighing that decision. Like, like I didn't think about that when I was a kid. And I don't know if a lot of people do. Like, what is going to be what I'm going to make and what, you know, can I be able to pay off this degree from this this university? And so what are some guidance for advisors working with, with clients who are engaging in college planning for helping their kids pick the right choice and pick the right path for them that will give them the highest return on their investment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the most important things for parents to remember is that about 30% of kids go to college undeclared and about 50% change their major over the course of their college career. So I would be very um, leery of making the recommendation that, oh, you know, <laughs> Jamie wants to be an engineer, so it's fine for him to take out, you know, go to a high price school and take out lots of loans because his engineering career will pay for that. Um, mm -hmm. That is, um, it's, it's a very risky, you know, risky strategy to undertake, you know, far better for a family to look at what their resources are. Um, and, and those may be some savings, some ability to pay out of their incomes, a contribution from their student, they may be eligible for the American Opportunity Tax Credit, um, their student may be able to get outside scholarships, they may be okay with their student taking out the direct student loan, which is a very reasonable amount for a student to, um, to take out um, for college. And add those things all up, and that'll give you a budget. Um, another thing that I think families often overlook is um, is the large amount of merit scholarships that are available at public universities. Um, so you can oftentimes get through your own in-state public school for a lot cheaper than than you than you think. Most most states want to keep their brightest kids in state, and so making it financially compelling for them to attend their local school um, can be is one of the best tools they have they have for that there are so many great pathways for um for kids to get co through college where it doesn't work is where parents say my child has to go to an ivy league school if that's your approach then you need to expect to pay ivy league tuition <laughs> um um, but if you're willing to say, you know, here are the kinds of experiences I want my kid to have while they're in college. You know, I want them to be at a big school. I want them to have, and I'm just thinking, you know, things that were important to my son. He wanted to go to a big school. He did not want to go to Oregon. He, um, you know, he um, thought he wanted to be a business major, but his reasoning for that was, I don't like reading enough to be a liberal arts major, and I'm definitely not a STEM guy. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and frankly, that's some pretty evolved thinking for an 18 year old. <laughs> um, but, you know, he had specific things that, that he wanted in his college experience. And he also had a specific budget for college. And, um, and we were able to um, come up with a pathway for him. Um, but a lot of it involved him doing the legwork and figuring out, you know, where he could shave some dollars off of, off of his, off of his costs. And he, um, 
He was not a great student. Um, he did not have a 3.5 GPA, but he knocked it out of the park on the ACT and found a college that had a scholarship for a student like him who um, did very well in the ACT and not so awesome in the classroom. And that allowed him to go to a big public out-of-state college for the same price that would have cost him to um, to stay here. And, you know, when we started pressing him on, it looked like it cost more to go there than to go here. You know, he was able to do a bunch of research and find out that, you know, actually one of his offer letters was quoting a really high um, dorm cost and meal plan. And at Oregon, they were quoting a lower one. And so actually the prices were closer than he thought. And by the way, he was willing to be an RA. He had been a camp counselor and the school he wanted to go to had a shortage of male RAs. And so there was a good, very good chance that he could, um, you know, that he could do that. And, you know, in the school that he chose, once you're accepted, they keep your tuition steady for all four years. And so, you know, so that's kind of like a two thousand dollar a year scholarship mm -hmm. that he's, you know, that he's getting by by choosing to go to a place that won't that won't raise his tuition. And it's in a state where the cost of living is lower. So his apartment, you know, his rent on his apartment is a couple hundred dollars a month less than a comparable apartment um, here would be. So think about the experiences you want your kid to have, the learning environment that works for them. Don't think of what the name, what the brand name on their diploma um needs needs to be when they come out because there are so many great colleges out there that do just a fantastic job of preparing kids to succeed at the highest levels i mean every year if you look at who's selected for Rhodes scholars at least a quarter of the Rhodes scholars recipients come from public colleges that admit more than 50 percent of applicants um and and so um you know, and then you look at who does and doesn't get into the Ivy Leagues. You know, lots and lots of successful people were turned down from Harvard. Ted Kaczynski, you know, the Unabomber did get in. Um, um, Where's that? This, this, <laughs> yeah, Again, the so that the anti-Harvard <laughs> <laughs> commercial. You know, Penn State has produced more Fortune 500 CEOs than Stanford has. So there are loads and loads of great opportunities out there for 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 kids to get the education and skills that they need to to compete at the highest levels in our society what's one or two policy things that right now you you kind of find interesting as it relates to you know college planning student loans whatever it might be um or even you know i guess maybe it could go broader uh you know i just throwing out a couple for conversation fodder right we've got um, the Secure Act 2.0, if you're paying back your student loans, companies can match into retirement accounts. Uh, I mean, we've had constant student debt forgiveness conversations forever. And then uh, I think uh, the other one I like recently, at least the, the Florida's one bill I like, which is the uh, financial literacy, which I think it's maybe eight or nine states are, are moving in that direction probably this year of adding that high school financial literacy uh, requirement into their curriculum. But anything out there, I mean, any of those, anything else you really think that would be helpful in this world or for advisors or to pay attention to? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, there's so there's there's always so much going on at the you know particularly at the federal level um, in in education policy. I think another big one um, out there is the free college talk. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things I hear a lot from people is, you know, my kid's young, free college has a lot of momentum behind it. I probably don't need to bother saving for um, saving for college. Um, and I would say that's probably a mistake because you know free college is a great program and I do hope that it moves forward. Um, I will say I went to UC Berkeley and paid $700 a semester to go there. So college was practically free in my lifetime. And, and there's no reason other than will that we can't, that we couldn't make it the same way, um, you know, for, for future generations. Um, um, but I would say so, um, so with free college, I would say that is limited to tuition. It's limited to in-state public schools, and there are some income caps on it, which is, you know, unfortunate for people on either the coasts, because chances are, you know, if you're, if you, if you live on, on one or the other coast, you're probably not going to qualify. But it also does not mean that a free college is going to come to your neighborhood. It, me it still means that you're going to have to probably go somewhere if you, if you do qualify. So you need to be 
ready to pay for room and board or, you know, ready to agree with whatever stipulations it is, whether it's two years of community college first um, and, you know, and two years of public college first after that. Um, I think student loan forgiveness is another fascinating, um, fascinating conversation. Um, one of the things that I always wonder is why we're not having a conversation about student loan interest rates instead, because I think that I think that um, adjusting interest rates on student loans would would offer a whole lot more relief to a lot more people and be a far more politically palatable conversation. So people who are paying graduate school loans or parent plus loans for college are often paying interest rates north of seven or eight percent. And there's no opportunity to refinance those within the you know within the federal system. Someone like that who could have their interest rate lowered to like three percent Mm-hmm. Um, where it's still a profitable loan for the federal government, that would be far more beneficial than having ten thousand dollars worth of um, of loans forgiven. Um, um, I think the um, public service loan forgiveness temporary waiver is something that needs to be heard a lot more about. So this is the current program that goes through October that is allowing people who have um, ten years of public service work with student loans with payments being made are eligible to have their loans forgiven even if they don't qualify for um, under under the current program rules where you have to be in an income-based plan and um, um, and have to have certain certain types of loans so I think you know those are um, you know that's been that's been a big thing I you know I love the idea of financial literacy curriculum in our schools as a parent of um, kids who've gone through high school recently, the high school curriculum is absolutely jam packed with stuff. So, um, um, so I, I, you know, I sort of wonder what it would replace, um, just because high school students are, you know, are pretty busy learning, uh, you know, learning an awful, awful lot of stuff. I do think it's, I do think it's an important topic and, um, and, and would love to see it, um, would love to see it addressed um, far better than, you know, all the stock picking games that they tend to have in um, high school econ classes. I think it would be much better to understand like compound interest and, um, and how credit cards work and what your credit score is. And which a friend of mine doing a high school presentation, she's an advisor and was doing a high school presentation. She said, you're told them your credit score is your SAT score for adults. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a good idea. No, but yeah, the, the, that whole conversation about teaching those critical elements, I think is, I'm very passionate about that just because I was super ignorant when I went to school and didn't understand any of that. And, got in, into a lot of trouble that way. So I would love for the youth to know those things before they go off to college. But, um, and one more thing I'm curious about uh, to hear a perspective on is like diff- like alternative approaches to kind of getting credits before you go to college. Like I know there are AP mm-hmm. courses or IB courses that might be able to qualify for college credit at some point. But are there other opportunities like for instance, I went to college when I was a junior and a senior. I took classes in my high school um, through Adam State University. Like, so I went into college with like nine credits. So I had like a little jump start, and it was a lot cheaper because I didn't have to, you know, do certain things. But are there approaches like that currently that you know advisors could recommend to their their clients to consider for their students to to lower the cost and lower also the time that kids are in college? Yeah, there definitely are. There's so many opportunities for kids to do that. I mean, most states offer a program like what you just described, Anna, where you, you know, your junior and senior year, you might attend a community college or um, another local um, local college and get your get your credits there. Um, AP and IB classes are also a great great source of of credits, as are dual enrollment classes. So oftentimes there are math classes in particular at high schools that are aligned with a college curriculum and the student gets um, gets college credit for that. The, the thing with going down any of those paths is colleges set their own policies for how they're going to accept those credits. So they might give you credit towards your major, they might give you general education credit, they might give you placement but no credit. Um, or um, in the case of my daughter's college, they might tell you that was really nice that you took those classes. Oh, that's, oh, <laughs> um, that's terrible. <laughs> and, and no, and that sounds, that sounds worse than it is. But so I would say there's, there's two different ways that, that families need to look at these credits and, and that advisors can give guidance on as well. One is 
for the top colleges, taking a full suite of AP or IB classes, that's table stakes. You know, if you don't have that, you're not getting in. So, so there are, there are lots of places where those are simply an admissions requirement. Um, in, in other cases, it's worth understanding at, before you get into the process at some of your top choice schools, how they treat those, you know, will you actually get, get credit for, for those. Um, there's a third component of it that is, um, that is far less visible, but that is the issue of weighted versus unweighted GPAs. Many colleges award merit scholarships on the basis of unweighted GPA which means that if you took an AP class and got a B in it, that is not the same as getting an A in a regular class. That is the same as getting a B in a regular class. And, and, um, and merit scholarships are usually where the best money is available to, to the student. The other consideration for students um, again, particularly those who do like the um, running start program is what it's called in Washington, but you know where you where you do your junior and senior year um, at at a um, you know at a in a college program is um, you want to make sure that you go to a place that's going to give you full credit for those credits that you took because if you enroll in a college as a freshman, there's a vastly larger pool of scholarship dollars available to you than if you enroll as a transfer student. So you really want to make sure if you're not coming in as a freshman that you're that you're absolutely on a, on track to finish in in less time than a freshman. So for example, at um at the University of Oregon, there are loads of um loads of merit scholarships that are granted automatically to freshmen based on unweighted high school GPA that are automatically renewable for all four years. There's a, and I think the maximum one is like $7,000 a year for no application. You can get up to a full tuition scholarship with, um, with an application. Those are automatically renewable for freshmen for all four years. Coming in as a transfer student, I think the maximum scholarship is like $3,000. There's a far smaller number from, of them. You have to apply for it and it doesn't renew automatically. So, so that's a, so, so, so there's a lot of pieces to, you know, to the, to the puzzle about, um, about accruing those credits while you're in, while you're in high school. My general recommendation as an advisor and as a parent who had two kids go through a lot of those classes, one of whom it was a great fit for, the other of whom it was not, is choose those classes based on whether they're a fit for your kid. Mm -hmm. So better, higher, stronger is not always going to produce the best outcome. My son, had he taken a less rigorous high school course load, would have gotten another $12,000 a year in merit scholarships from, from his college. You know, but we were on that path of, oh, the more you do, the better, <laughs> you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the better it is. And it really came back, came back to bite us because his college award scholarships on the basis of unweighted GPA and his unweighted GPA was not, was not good in large part because he had taken classes that were too, too hard for him. My daughter, on the other hand, thrived in IB classes. Um, you know, she took every IB class she could get her hands on you know, including theater. Um, she loved the workload. She loved the intensity. She loved the rigor. And she feels very well prepared for her college where, where she is. And, and frankly, she wouldn't have been a candidate for admission there had she not, you know, had she not taken them. But she also got no credit um, for, for any of them. And in fact, had to take placement tests for, um, for key subject areas. So basically, do your research, know what the colleges will, will award and do and accept. It's it's good to yeah, <laughs> I mean, do what's right for your kid as a student. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think as an advisor, sense. it's as an advisor, it's really helpful to know what your in-state public school merit scholarship policies are. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, here in Oregon, which is pretty consistent with most states, we have automatic scholarships that are based on certain GPAs and um, and test scores. Most states do that for in-state kids. Um, and, and so if you can be communicating that to parents early in the game so that, you know, when your kid's a high school freshman, you already know, hey, we need a 3.8 GPA mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in order to, you know, having, having that is going to save us $7,000 a year once you get to college. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's very complex as it starts to get to all those things. And then even like 
you know, I, I went to Davidson and Davidson does, you know, it's a very small school and liberal arts and it's really harsh with some of these things. Um, so like transfer students in is like terrible there. Like they really discourage it to like all extent, both in and out. So like credits aren't really even kind of the same. You're just in a class. So when people try to transfer elsewhere and they're like, how many credit hours is it? It's almost impossible to get any credit leaving or coming into the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do remember uh, my roommate had a year abroad and he came in as a freshman because of the same thing that they would not like when he was looking to go there, they would not give any aid or anything for sophomores coming in like there's none. Right. So then he even though he had a full year of school, essentially just restarted as a freshman, a year older than everybody, <laughs> because he's like there, that was it. Like it was the only way that you, and you know, that's uh, it's just kind of a weird aspect of uh, the world, right? That, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they're their own institution. They decide the rules and they had some quirky rules around those types of things. And yeah. uh, well, that's how my daughter's college is. I mean, they basically said college is a four year experience. We want you to have a four year mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And but to their credit, they say we will give you enough financial aid that four years here is affordable for you. Yeah. So so, you know, there there are better and worse ways to ways to do that. But, um, you know, you bring up a good point where I mean, one of the biggest ways to waste money on college is to not graduate in four years. And oftentimes that's a result of transferring and not having your credits count. So mm -hmm. it's 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 really worth taking the time and putting the thought into, is the college that we're choosing for our kid a, a, the right fit? Is, mm -hmm. you know, is this a place where they're gonna be successful? Looking at things that, that your kid has done where they've thrived and other places where they've struggled and say, you know, <laughs> do we have more elements of the former or the latter in this um, in this environment is really a, a, a good exercise to, to take. The other thing, you know, coming back to our original conversation about negotiation is you should always negotiate your financial aid award. <laughs> to get started um, early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know that's that's a, a a good way to save a few a few thousand dollars. Last year, a hundred percent of my clients negotiated their financial aid award and got more money. So, and they averaged about four thousand dollars each. So, there's definitely good money to be made when you multiply that times four years. So, um, you know, by the time a college has admitted your student, they're probably committed to enrolling them as well. And uh, so. Stop for a minute. Be grateful for what they've offered you. Be grateful for the acceptance. But uh, but before you sign on the dot, ask them for more. Love it. That's well, awesome. This, this <laughs> has been really fascinating. I always love talking about college planning. I always find it so interesting. Um, and we always like to end on a, a positive note. So t t tell us, Anne, what you want your legacy to be in the profession and in, in your life. Oh, my gosh. Um, so so that's a, a an interesting question to answer right now because my the founder of my firm my professional mentor passed away a few weeks ago and so um so sorry to hear you know that. she was an absolute giant in the profession just extraordinarily generous with her time and energy and um you know both doing pro bono work and supporting other advisors coming coming in and I know I'm getting all teary again talking about her. Um, she's just, you know, she's a lovely person. So I de definitely have been spending a lot of time lately thinking about, um, you know, thinking about legacy. And um, um, I, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do a lot of in my in my practice is is help new advisors um, get get started and get up to speed. And and so I would like to think that I could leave a mark in that way because I think there are not enough of us to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and um, and so um, so that is certainly the you know the mark that I'd like to leave in the on the profession is helping more people get um, you know get involved here. I was a career changer coming into this and you know went through a lot of um, a lot of steps along the way. But um, um, and so I you know I have been doing what I can to help others in our area get started and um, grow the grow the fee only business. Well, that was beautiful. And, you know, thanks for sharing. Actually, I, you know, I know that's sometimes hard to take that moment and stop and think, especially about somebody that meant a lot to you and, you know, probably, you know, that you love tremendously and helped you out. But, you know, it's also kind of a, a testament to their memory and impact when you can, you know, share that to others and give them permission to, you know, be, you know, be better and impact more people. So it's, 
you know, thanks for sharing that with us too. Absolutely. And yeah, uh, uh, Anne and Anna, uh, fantastic today. Um, you know, this was a really fun conversation. I know we went a lot of different ways here from, you know, the negotiations and garage sales and, you know, Europe and Germany and uh, college education planning. So, you know, we don't always plan these out, but I think they they, they turn out pretty well. So maybe slightly better than a, a $2 yard sale today, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, and uh, what's the best uh, website or where are you uh, most reachable for people who uh, might want to reach out after the show? Um, so I have two websites. Um, well, my, um, my college planning website is howtopayforcollege.com. And so that's where I have tons and tons of information about creating a college plan, um, understanding how the FAFSA and the CSS profile work, um, financial aid and whatnot. And I have an online um, uh, do-it-yourself college financial plan course um, there there as well. So um, so that's the best way to, to find me. And I can never even remember my Twitter handle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm it's embarrassed that good, to say. <laughs> We'll find it. And, and what's the name of the book and when is it expected to come out? So How to Pay for College is expected out later this summer. Awesome. awesome. Well, we'll be making sure that uh, we're, we're buying copies and uh, you know sharing this uh, when it comes out too. So, uh, And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody else, thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. <laughs>